Depois deste momento de acolhimento, vamos dar início à conferência de abertura. Convidamos a subir ao palco a doutora Bárbara Lisson, uma voz destacada no mundo das bibliotecas, e o doutor Manuel Carvalho, do Jornal Público, que irá moderar a sessão. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm happy to be with you. And um, unfortunately, I am, can only say bom dia, but that is only, <laughs> and abrigada, <laughs> but that is only what I can say in, in Portuguese. Um, therefore, I'm very thankful to the um, simultaneous interpreters who will give my voice to you and give the content what I wanted to present to you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the school net, the library school network for the invitation to come to Lisbon. I'm very happy that I can be here with you and I hope I can stay with you and have some conversations afterwards and Manuel and I will have a talk after my presentation as well. Actually, I'm coming from Germany and I really want to sincerely congratulate to the country Portugal for this school library network because I think it is exceptional and it is so well established as far from what I got to know and compared with countries like mine, like Germany, it is really great that you have an organized, well-organized school library system. This is not the case in Germany. There are many reasons in Germany why this is not the case. Um, the 16 states who are responsible for culture are not really interested, as I might say, in a networked, um, uh, in a networked organization. They do their things in, in the 16 stage eat, and unfortunately that does not help the national development very much. So uh, congratulations again for your um, efforts and for your organization of the school library network. Really, I'm very impressed. So um, now to my talk. How can school libraries respond to the challenges that we are facing? Uh, there will be some text, and since there is this um, simultaneous uh, interpretation, I will read more than I normally do, but I think uh, it is good for the interpretation. I don't know whether you can um, follow everything in, in my English slides, um, but let's start. So I will try. Yes, so um, I would like to give some uh, indications how libraries can respond to the challenges that we are having nowadays. All, we always had challenges, but of course the challenging uh, situations are enhancing. And I would like to give you some, well, some clues and some keywords that are not necessarily and on the first vision uh, related to literacy or to media literacy, but you will perhaps understand why I do this. So the role of the school library, of course, there should be <laughs> a statement um, by me for this. It is the um, role to empower the students, um, to empower the students, of course, for learning, for knowledge, but also to become consumers of information that are discerning the information that they get. And this is so important because otherwise you cannot be an active participant of society. And that means that school libraries are one of the agents that equip the students with the essential skills for information literacy that they also teach the students to navigate the digital landscape and critically assess the sources and distinguish between reliable information and misinformation. 
I think this is one thing which is new to us, especially new in a way how important it became to discern between information that is reliable and information that is not reliable, because there is so much information. We heard that already in uh, the first talks. So what are the challenges that come from? Um, I would like to refer to the challenges that IFLA, I was IFLA president uh, two year, for the last two years, um, that IFLA already dis discovered or observed um, 10 years ago, but these challenges have enhanced, they are still more or less the same. So the new technologies will both expand and limit those who have access to information. There is the information poor and the information rich, and that really has not become a uh, solution because um, the information became more and more and people are not able to find the right information without uh, knowledge and without certain help. And on online education will, on the one hand side, democratize the learning on the other hand, it will disrupt the learning. And of course, the boundaries between data protection and privacy are being redefined. So what can I tell about other people? What can I know about other people? And of course, the hyper-connected societies will listen to and empower new groups. We find so many new groups coming up, giving up information we were never expecting that these, these many groups could um, be present in the information scene. So the global information and the global economy will be transformed by the new technology and this is an ongoing process. This was 10 years ago and it's still an ongoing process. It did not change at all. So how, which challenges are to overcome by the libraries, by the school libraries, by anybody? We have to overcome the information overkill. We need a diverse and inclusive society, and that is we have to build a diverse and inclusive society. The deepening inequalities have to be overcome as well. The digital divide, information poor, information rich. And of course, the STEM and STEAM education. You know STEM, that is uh, the abbreviation for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The education in these subjects has to be more prominent in the schools than they might have been, and also, of course, more prominent in the school libraries. The depletion of reading skills, really. Also in my country, in Germany, the reading skills are going down, non, non, uh, regardless to the library's work. Um, digital citizenship is important uh, because um, so many administration now only um, talk with the citizens in online versions. Paper is not that much used anymore. Another thing is that mental and physical health becomes an issue more and more, and we have to overcome the problems that are based. The engagement of the freedom of expression and information, that is something which is also very important, and I will come to that later. So let's start with some ways how school libraries could um, enhance their work in a way that is not related to school learning. Maybe put it like that. And one, one key word for me is edutainment. Edutainment is a combination of the words entertaining and education. That means that uh, the edutainment is learning having fun and learning by not knowing that you are learning because you are enjoying what you are doing. So uh, edutainment, I think it is very important, not only in the, in the classroom, but especially in the school library. So what would that mean for school libraries? So the educational aspect, uh, when you bring 
and uh, when you bring entertainment objects into the school, into the school library, there is education meant, but the people whom you are addressing are not really knowing that this is education. They want, they want to see joy, and you give them joy, but by having joy, they are learning. So this is a very, in my opinion, it is a very important thing, and any library uh, needs to be striving for education that is based, not only of course, but also based on having fun when learning, on entertainment, um, so edutainment. So the benefits for, uh, for school libraries and for the school, for the, for the pupils and the students might be that um, the learning is more interesting, the educational message is um, coming through a popular media, is coming through popular subjects, there is a higher motivation, gamification tools, um, perhaps you are using gamification tools in your school libraries already, uh, it is a creation of a retention of interest in learning because they want to have uh, want to be entertained, the pupils. And it is, of course, giving new um, ways of cre creating creativity for problem solution for learning. So it might also be an enhancement of thinking because it is a much broader scope that you are um, looking at. Of course, um, motivating environment is very important. We just heard about uh, the president of the Gulbenkian Foundation, how he was addressed uh, in the environment that was called a library, a school library. But this, as he said, and as I know, uh, has changed, but it still needs to be enhanced, I think. So the characteristics of a motivating school library space uh, include, of course, I, I think you know a lot of this, welcoming, vibrant, and culturally interesting environment. It should be an inclusive environment. It should be, of course, um, based on fluid design flexible principles. It is a, a place for end-to-end -end learning, and it shows how knowledge is created sometimes. It should be a place for exploring and a place for curiosity knowledge. It should also be a quiet space on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, it should be a vivid space. So it should be a differentiated space in one room. It should be a space for collaboration. It should be a space for showing things, for presenting things, sharing things, and also celebration. And it should be a place to discover, to practice and share, a breakout place to work in groups, and of course, it should be a makerspace, not only makerspace in the sense that there is digital devices, or that there is a 3D printing and things like that, a makerspace in the sense of we can do something, we can produce something. So have a look. These are pictures from school libraries. On the left, you see pictures from school libraries, grammar school libraries in New Zealand. On the right, you see pictures from New York. So different kinds of uh, atmosphere, different, different kinds of ambiences. So the main thing what you see in these pictures is inviting, cozy, stimulating, and also energizing. We just heard from the minister about artificial intelligence. So many people now think, oh, artificial intelligence, that's a threat to us. We, that's a danger. We have to react and we have to defend ourselves from artificial intelligence. And I think, as the minister already said, this is just the wrong way to do it. We should adapt everything which is useful for, our, for us through inter, uh, artificial intelligence, but we also should be a critical user for this. So, um, in many ways, artificial intelligence is not that known to librarians. Only on the 30th of November last year, when ChatGPT came out, that was a breakthrough 
for the world of artificial intelligence. And it was also coming out, well, what is this? How are we going to deal with it? How do teachers recognize that the works that they get um, are artificially created or created by the students? And you see, there is Elizabeth Hutchinson. Um, she is a librarian and she has a chat, uh, a podcast on artificial intelligence and school libraries. So I really would like you to have a look at her, um, her sayings. She discusses the words, the, the impact of artificial intelligence to school libraries. So that's her quote. I believe that in this new world of AI, these skills will be at the forefront of teaching and the skills of the school librarian will be paramount. Imagine, the school librarian does not uh, lose their jobs. The skills are paramount for the work in the school because they, the school librarians have always guided and taught students to navigate the world of fake news and misinformation and other things. But what is the precondition? The precondition is that every librarian, also the school librarians, they have to be in forefront of the knowledge. So the main thing is getting knowledge about AI, getting knowledge how to use it, getting knowledge how to understand what it could be uh, useful or perhaps a bit dangerous to the work. And I heard that the program also is related to artificial intelligence. I'm very happy that this is the case. So the possible benefits of AI for school librarians' work are, of course, the processes. We all, as librarians, we all deal with processes because we have to present something, we have to produce an environment, we have to produce services. So AI can also help to improve the processes or to speed them up. Of course, the importance of the um, help to students how to learn AI. So I think the school librarian has the role to be in forefront, not only for the students to get the real impact of artificial intelligence, but also for the teachers. I still remember uh, in many cases in Germany and in other countries that the teachers were very reluctant when it came to uh, online learning, when it came to um, media and uh, online media. They were very, very reluctant. Maybe they are still reluctant with artificial intelligence as well, but the librarian has to be progressive and has to tell the teachers as well, who perhaps don't know yet, um, but be before that, the librarian has to know. So further education in this context is so important. Now let's come to the intellectual freedom and promoting of access to information, the freedom. You see, IFLA is always very much uh, in this ethical topic. And we also have a special group that is established for that intellectual freedom and access to information. Um, the censorship that we experience in many countries in Europe and especially in the United States against um, certain subjects, against certain books in the libraries, um, this is a really critical thing and we have to fight against this as much as we can. How can we as librarians fight? So I think it is important to look at um, supporters and who supports the librarians. The librarians as a, as a profession are supported by the professional associations. And I would like to show you some statements of professional associations. This is the School Librarian Association of the United Kingdom who clearly says that the principle above personal opinion and reason above prejudice is very important when it comes to intellectual freedom. It is necessary that the pupils are enabled to make informed judgments for their daily life. Informed judgments, that is very important. And of course, that it is necessary that actively oppose censorship for any purpose other than the material which is 
lawfully against uh, or based on censorship. So we all have laws in our countries that reduce the access to information because of criminal um, of criminal intents. So that is very important. I think Portugal has more or less the same laws. It's a country of the European Union um, that say when information is secret, why, why, which information should not be given to the public and so on. But this is a law and we should follow the law. And if the law does not say, for instance, I think in your constitution you also have the um, intention of free access to information, then this has a, such a big value to our work and we always have to refer to that. I, as a librarian, a German librarian in my country, uh, as a public librarian as well, I had to defend censorship from both sides, from the left side against books coming from the right publishers, and also from right from the right political side against book coming from more left publishers. And what, what, what do you do in these cases? In these cases, you refer to your constitutional law. And the constitution is something nobody really can uh, attack. Of course, they can publicly. But you always have the right to refer to your constitution. And this is the most important thing. So there is, from the US, um, a, a reference to the teacher librarians coming to freedom of expression rights and, and the school libraries. Teacher librarians, by virtue of their dual, dual professional qualifications in teaching and in librarianship, play the role of standard bearers for freedom of expression rights within the school community. And there, the second sentence is very important because the librarians address two different codes of ethics. The, the school librarians, the teacher librarians, address the code of ethics for the libraries. Maybe your association has a code of ethics for the libraries. Uh, IFLA has one. Go to the internet, you will find it. And also the code of ethics for the teaching profession, whereas the teachers only have to refer to the code of ethics for the teaching profession. So you have a dual role in this, and you have also a dual relationship to the codes of ethics that uh, are basis for your work. So foster intellectual freedom and access of information could be enhanced in school libraries by making accessible what is really needed for the intellectual development of the of the citizens and the future citizens, I mean the students and the pupils, um, school libraries have the opportunity to be an open space, an open space that is not restricted to, let's say, hours uh, in, in the way that the class comes or not. So you can have an open space and you could, could also introduce constructive discussions, you can introduce special readings, special meetings, in the school libraries. And of course, um, foster ethical issues as in your, in your daily work. So you see, IFLA has mm, published several guidelines and several manifestos on school libraries. And I want to cite uh, the IFLA school library guidelines. The core values of equity of access to recorded knowledge and information and of intellectual freedom are embodied in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the value of IFLA. So if you want to refer to this, go to the IFLA website, please, and find this. And of course, the Article 19 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, being from 1949, is so essential for our work and that some, maybe in some countries, there is no constitutional right to the access of information. But there is always the right in Article 19 of the United Nations one can refer to. We talked about the United Nations and um, something which is very important uh, in these days 
are the sustainable development goals. And I hope that uh, also, I know that Portugal and Portugal libraries are also working uh, on these sustainable development goals. You see there are 17 goals, and IFLA has worked up different programs how libraries can do an impact into sustainable development goals and how libraries can also profit in advocacy by uh, doing um, the, interne the international advocacy <coughs> program. And you see, goal number four is the goal for education, and it's also, of course, the goal for school libraries. Goal number four says, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So goal number four is a special goal, I think, for you as well. Um, how could school libraries do this? Um, there is um, something which can be found on the internet that's the library map of the world. The library map of the world also refers to the sustainable development goals. And uh, there is a part, and several countries show, also show how school libraries can present the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and foster them as well. For instance, you see here, it's Croatia. Uh, school libraries help to implement an educational program for sustainable development. You can also see the Netherlands. School libraries program improves children's academic skills in the Netherlands. Or that is something from Colombia, also Latin America. School librarians and science teachers collaborate to improve children's environmental literacy. This is all related programs and related projects to the Sustainable Development Goals. And IFLA also supports those who want to work with them. Uh, on their website, there are different, of course, information. There is a leaflet, access and opportunity for all. And then there is a lot of, a, a lot, a lot of good and best practice examples. And one thing which is also related, kind of related to the sustainable development goals is the key word sharing economy. You know, sharing economy and li libraries are, well, one of the really big actors by sharing economy because we are lending out books, mainly books, but we are also lending out other things. And I would like to just refer to the library of things concept. I don't know whether um, any Portuguese school libraries also uh, has a library of things. Is anyone here who has a library of things in, in their school libraries? No, not yet, not yet, <laughs> not yet. So you see to the, to, the, uh, to the left, that's my library in Bremen, my former library in Bremen. And uh, the other thing is from, um, Port uh, from uh, England. So the Library of Things is a collection of things that people use sometimes, but do not use e every time. And so the uh, idea is to have things in the library to lend out who are not needed for the whole year, who are not needed in the households, who, give, who, have, who, who take a lot of space sometimes in the houses. And so this is a growing trend in public libraries. And look, this is everything which you can have in public libraries or perhaps in your school libraries soon. Um, that is not necessary for all the time in a household, but people can lend out. You see, a lot of different things. Um, we even had a sledge in Bremen, but it doesn't snow so much in Bremen. But the first day, of course, when it snowed, there were many people who wanted this one sledge which we had. So this is a different kind of working with the public, bringing the library of things. There are so many interesting things that you can imagine. And of course, they should be related to the public. They should be related, I think, in the school libraries to the students and also to the teachers. So my concluding remarks and my recommendation. You, you know what makes a good school libraries. You know what makes a good school librarian. But I also want to say dynamic, dynamic hubs, that you should be a creative space that you should also know the needs of your 
customers, the students and the teachers, and respond to the needs, of course, and respond to the challenges that we have just seen. I think the ideal cooperation scheme for a successful school libraries is that the teachers and the staff of the school, of course the teacher librarian, the school librarian, and the parents are working together to improve the knowledge, to improve the well-being of the students. So what makes a teacher a good partner to a school librarian? Of course, communication is very important. There should be a very well-established communication uh, between those two. Uh, a good teacher uh, shows empathy, of course, to this, not only to the students, but also, hopefully, to the librarians. And also, uh, a good teacher should share best practice for, for their knowledge in order to improve the work, their work, and also the uh, school library's work. And the teacher librarians are, as I said, and as you know very well, experts in information, in promoting reading, in technology integration, and of course in advocacy. Because I think it is also your task to go to administration and do advocacy for the school library to get the resources and to get the right budget to be well developed. And of course the parents as well. The parents should value the school library. The parents should be interested in the being of the school library. They should also give feedback and suggest their ideas. And the interaction between parents and school librarians, I think, is very important. And sometimes also volunteer engagement by the parents to help with the work in the school libraries, that is also very important. So in summary, the teacher librarians are educational leaders. They are leaders. I think this is important. This word is very important. And they empower the students to become critical thinkers, effective researchers, and also lifelong learners. So the school library also contributes to the idea of an individual. Yes, when I leave school, I still go on learning because I saw that learning is interesting, that learning gives fun, and you as a school librarian can contribute to this approach. So when is a school library effective? Of course, you know this. It is effective in concrete when it helps to close the educational gap. So between the classroom and the real life, you are the school library in between, and you bring people and information together. So basic recommendations uh, for school librarians are stay curious all your life and be open for innovation. I think this is critical, and we heard that already today. And treat your service or treat education as a service and not as a must-have. It is a service that you offer. And consequently, treat the students as your customers, as your clients. Have a look what they are interested in and try to reach them through uh, responding to their interests. And Stop doing things that are not interested to the students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also try to, to open up the horizon of the students, to get them new knowledge, to be curious again. So through our, through your curiosity, the students can also keep going in their curiosity as well. And my very last recommendation now as IFLA president or past IFLA president, monitor IFLA's activities for school libraries. We have a special group in IFLA that is the school library group. We have the UNESCO IFLA school library manifesto of 1999, which is also just being uh, in, uh, in, in review. And you see there is even a lot of, a lot of Portuguese in the IFLA website that you can find, thanks to our colleagues from Portugal who are translating 
uh, important documents uh, into their language. And we have IFLA school library guidelines. So there is many things that you are, might be interested in, in getting knowledge how IFLA treats the school libraries, and perhaps they are helpful for you as well. So thank you very much for your attention. you don't mind just to give a few words in Portuguese for this audience and just a few words. Bom, bom dia, enfim, para um jornalista como os professores, em Portugal é sempre melhor falar em português, mas como eu percebi que quase ninguém pôs os headphones para a tradução simultânea, eu precisava de uma instrução de organização para saber se continua a conversa com a Bárbara em inglês, eu acho que sim, acho que é mais recomendável, portanto, uma vez que toda a gente, que toda a gente entende. No entanto, só duas ou três palavras de saudação e de agradecimento na nossa língua. Muito rapidamente, em primeiro lugar, portanto, agradecer o convite para estar aqui neste, neste encontro. A professora sabe perfeitamente que nós no público e principalmente no público na escola, nós estamos muito próximos com o trabalho que vocês fazem nas vossas bibliotecas. Nós queremos participar e fazemos tudo o que estiver ao nosso alcance para vos poder estar ao vosso lado e, quanto mais não seja, até porque depois de ouvirmos esta intervenção da Bárbara, nós ficamos a perceber ainda melhor, de uma forma bastante mais intensa, do trabalho e do papel e da importância que o trabalho que vocês fazem tem para, não apenas para a educação, num sentido muito estrito do termo, mas fundamentalmente para aquilo que são as perspectivas que nós temos enquanto sociedade no futuro próximo e no futuro distante. Por isso, muitos parabéns a todos vocês, muito obrigado por estar aqui, é com grande prazer que eu estou, que eu estou aqui, enfim, eu comecei a minha carreira como professor, por isso estou, estou muito bem aqui e parabéns pela vossa, pelo vosso trabalho e parabéns também Pela, pela vossa missão difícil que têm para, para representar. Well, let's change the, the mindset. Uh, let's uh, speak in English. Uh, thank you very much for your very deep and very meaningful uh, uh, presentation. It was really interesting because, uh, let me say you, that uh, it opened my mind. Because I, I, uh, normally, uh, it's not my profession, of course, but normally you think as a libra as a, uh, um, of a lib librarian as a a guy or, or a woman that uh, keeps the books and uh, talks with books with the, with the kids. Uh, it's much more than that. Uh, it's really, really important as educator, as a, a, a citizen that has a special role in uh, um, uh, creating new habits, new way of thinking and new uh, defenses for this um, challenging and uh, sim simultaneously dangerous society that we are uh, uh, going to. Well, uh, my first question, uh, and let me say you that I just ask three or four questions to Barbara, and then I call you, call the audience, to present your own uh, uh, questions uh, until uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, my, my first question is um, exactly where is it? Ah, it's here. Uh, it, it's exactly, there's a change in the way how we, th we see and we think about the, the, the role of the uh, teachers, librarians. Uh, it happens, why? Why do you think it's, the, 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 their role, what we ask to them has changed uh, so much? It's because of the digital society, the new uh, world that we are uh, walking to. It's because of that that we need that the librarians should do another uh, job than to lend or uh, receive uh, books from the kids? Uh, you don't have... Uh, yeah. we are okay, we share. <laughs> Let's share. Again, sharing economy. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, of course, it is, it is not just because the world is changing, it is because our uh, attitudes uh, are changing and um, it is changing what we receive from the outer world. So uh, in former times the only information source was a book. And then came the internet, that's another information source. And then there was of course um, social media, that's the next step, there's another information source. And so the, the book has 
um, become less important. But that does not mean that the content that is represented in the book is less important and the knowledge that people should get. So the way to uh, promote knowledge other than lending out books is so important. The other thing is that especially the younger uh, the younger generation and of course the kids in school, they are used to add entertainment, they are used to a world which is full of pictures. Imagine how many Instagram pictures, how billions of Instagram pictures are in the world and it's not only Instagram, it's also of course the promotion, the marketing, the ads, they are full of pictures. If we give out books only, we are at a loss. So we have to integrate the desire for entertainment, the desire for a world which is a visual world into our world in order to keep the attention uh, of those people who need knowledge but have to uh, be addressed in another way than just giving out books. Well, uh, but don't you think that thinking about that, okay, let's say we uh, we cannot compete, the books cannot compete with the, the uh, digital languages, the images, the hats, and so on, and so on, and so on. But uh, at the same time, when we think about that, and we uh, ask for uh, edutainment, uh, I never heard about, uh, heard about this, this word, I've, I've heard about infotainment, and I hate infotainment, because I'm a journalist. Uh, <laughs> talking about uh, edutainment, it doesn't mean that what is required for act of reading, it is time, uh, concentration, uh, reflection. Uh, it's we are giving up these uh, attitudes that normally we have uh, towards the, the the books that are really so important for our development, for our ideas, for our way to see and to in, and to and to and to look for the and interpret the world. But you think that we are not giving up with this idea of edutainment? No, I don't think so. It is not a controversy. It is an addition, I think. So, um, if if you have just just a book and nothing else to give to the young generation, then you are lost, in my opinion. They, then you are completely lost. Maybe there are some peculiar, peculiar people who are still interested in books only, but I really cannot imagine that this is the case. So. You are completely right that there is a uh, well, there is a competition between the book reading time and the other reading time. So, the time which we have, we still have 24 hours to live per day, and what is now uh, uh, put into these 24 hours, it's much more than, let's say, 40 years ago. So, we have to find a way that people. Um, create their spare time also for getting information. And when we talk about school libraries, it is, of course, getting information, getting knowledge, and it's also acquiring attitudes, acquiring approaches to become a long-life learner. That is also important. It is um, important to give the full spectrum and do not judge, in my opinion, that learning through a serious internet um, website is less important than learning through a book. That is not the case, in my opinion. But, of course, using a book for, like you just said, um, thinking, contemplation, and a slower pleasure as well, yes, and a slower way of learning, I think this is a combination and the competition is hard, but it should not be given up that the pleasure of reading is really a pleasure, but it doesn't, it's not the only pleasure we have. And so to show how this combination of different kinds of pleasures um, can 
can be fun, can help you in your daily life, can help you in your development. Okay, just, just another question before I uh, call the whole audience to, to participate. Um, one of the uh, uh, very important roles that you uh, see in the, in the uh, libraries is the fight against uh, censorship and uh, uh, for freedom of, sp of speech. Um, it's uh, for me as a journalist. It's, it's great to, to 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 have this kind of uh, alliance uh, with with the the, the the libraries. But at the same time, you asked, uh, you remembered a very uh, critical issue that it's uh, 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 happening each time more uh, regularly in, in Europe or in, in the United States. That it's the um, the cancel culture against a certain kind of books. Um, and uh, you defined the uh, certain attitudes uh, that uh, the, the, the teachers, the librarians, should have um, uh, to uh, solve that sort of, of conflicts, of, of problems. Uh, you mean, I, I was hearing you and I said, what she's saying, what Barbara is saying, is that uh, the librarians should be people, progressive people. Is that true? Do you mean, is it true that they should be, or do you mean, is it true that they are? They should, <laughs> um, they should continue being progressive people. <laughs> no. I, 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 th I think that a human being wanting to become a librarian has a special attitude towards life and has a special attitude towards the way of thinking. Um, otherwise, people would become, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, not boring, but otherwise people would perhaps not be interested in getting into a profession that is so much related to knowledge. And therefore, um, and knowledge is nothing which is static. Knowledge is something which is dynamic, developing. And therefore, I think everyone, and you see, it's not only knowledge, it's also being related to persons. So, um, some people say, and I, I agree with them, that libraries and librarians should be related to people more than to books. And um, that is also because books are dynamic as well. I mean, not the, this one book is dynamic, but the book world is dynamic. And people who are surrounding us, they are dynamic. And we have to follow this dynamism um, by being progressive. And I think everyone, and you are sitting here because you are, in a way, interest in, interested in being progressive because you are interested in learning. So librarians are, I think, a very important profession that promotes learning. Unfortunately, I have to say, our image in most of the countries of the world is a bit contradictory. We are sitting at our desks reading books. <laughs> nice job, you know. So many people say, oh, what a nice job you have. Perhaps you, you experienced this as well. What a nice job you have reading all the time. That is so nice. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that is. And so you, you have, I think all of you, you have already developed um, a way how to react to such a sentence. So, uh, <laughs> and of course, you know, there are people who say, these people who are sitting at their desks, they have their progressive minds uh, creating, being created at the desks. But then you have to get out. And I always say, uh, being, being the president of, of a library association, being the president of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, I always say, get out and tell people how good you are, the impact that you are giving to society, and you can only do this because you are progressive. And should, they should be proud of that, of course. It's very important. 
Well, uh, we have um, around uh, 15 minutes, well, a little bit less, uh, for whom wants to uh, pose a question to, to Barbara, please. Uh, you can ask in Portuguese and uh, we have uh, some, it, I can translate, I can help uh, if you feel more comfortable in doing that. No? Ah, sorry. Development of I, I think it should be better to repeat the main idea because maybe people over there cannot hear. Uh, I would there. I would love to to listen to your point of view uh, about the way intel uh, artificial intelligence can foster critical mind and uh, the development of students. Uh, Anybody else? Well. I think this is a crucial question, <laughs> of course. You see, when we talk about artificial intelligence, the whole world is full of artificial intelligence. The whole world. What came out as a very popular product is ChatGPT. So I refer to ChatGPT because artificial intelligence is already, when you go to the bathroom and hand your, hold your hands under the tab and the water comes out, this is already artificial intelligence. So imagine that the whole world is already full and we really did not recognize everything. Now our, our conscience becomes, ah, well, artificial intelligence. But I refer to ChatGPT. Because ChatGPT, who of you already met ChatGPT? Who had experience with ChatGPT? Great, great. And all the others will follow. <laughs> so I think ChatGPT can support your critical thinking in a very special way. First of all, the content of ChatGPT, which is billions, 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 billions of facts, and not facts, but information bits, is only until 2021. So ChatGPT is absolutely stupid after 21. Okay? So this is one thing. Of course, they are developing, but the whole, the whole information that is there needs to be updated as well, as we need to be updated as well. So when you go to ChatGPT, who has already um, asked ChatGPT for their curriculum vitae? Not so many, I see. Try, try this and you will, you will be surprised with whom you are married. You will be surprised when you were born. <laughs> And one, one thing which I, which I once did, I was asked by someone to write an article on a topic which is not really my topic. So I asked ChatGPT, what is the content, what would be a content of an article on the topic this and this? And you always have to address ChatGPT as a very kind person. You say, hello ChatGPT, you are an expert in this and this, and I would like you to write me an article. Please, please. And then ChatGPT, Chet and this article should have uh, 5,000 words. And then ChatGPT says, I'm sorry, Five, I cannot write an article of 5,000 words, but I can give you the content page for this. Okay, then I thank you and so on. So this is, you, you, have, you experience a lot of conversation with ChatGPT. And of course, ChatGPT, in the, in the consequence, you get something which let's call information. But the critical thinking is that you should check 
whether this information is correct. Check by your knowledge, because you are an expert in that, in that issue, or check by your just clean and brave brains that you have. So the critical thinking starts when you have a product by ChatGPT, whatever it is, let's, let's look at your, at your curriculum vitae, that is critical thinking because you say, oh no, that's not me, I'm not married to that person. I'm... So, um, so it is important that you do not accept ChatGPT as the Bible. You, you can have ChatGPT as a supporting instrument for things to do, also for translating. I mean, we all, knew, we all know Google Translate, ChatGPT does almost the same, maybe even better sometimes. So critical thinking starts with the product of ChatGPT that you want him, them, her to do. You see, that is you can you can use it. It 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 is a it can be a useful tool, but never use it without checking whether this is correct or not, what you get. And when you get something, you always, and I think pupils do that, now they are smart enough, these pupils, they get the information and then they reframe it, then they rewrite it a little bit, but they have the information. And by doing this, by reframing the information, by rewriting the information, also the pupils um, increase their knowledge in a way, because the first thing is, oh, I should write it that the teacher does not understand that it's from ChatGPT. <laughs> so this, this is already an intellectual demand. It's an intellectual task that the, 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 the thing that you get from ChatGPT, the product, the lines, should be changed and should be changed that it is still, it is still relevant and it's still correct. So I think this is quite an intellectual uh, demand for pupils, if they are smart enough. And that creates also critical thinking. And it's a brave new world. Well, uh, your time, our time is gone. Um, thank you very much, Marbar, for your uh, presentation and for this conversation. Thank you very much. Obrigado a todos. Bom dia.